Chapter 13 It was the knot of wordy socialists and working-class philosophers that held forth in the city hall park on warm afternoons that was responsible for the great discovery. Once or twice in the month, while riding through the park on his way to the library, Martin dismounted from his wheel and listened to the arguments, and each time he tore himself away reluctantly. The tone of discussion was much lower than at Mr. Morse's table. The men were not grave and dignified. They lost their tempers easily and called one another names, while oaths and obscene allusions were frequent on their lips. Once or twice he had seen them come to blows. And yet, he knew not why, there seemed something vital about the stuff of these men's thoughts. Their legomachy was far more stimulating to his intellect than the reserved and quiet dogmatism of Mr. Morse. These men, who slaughtered English, gesticulated like lunatics, and fought one another's ideas with primitive anger, seemed somehow to be more alive than Mr. Morse and his crony, Mr. Butler. Martin had heard Herbert Spencer quoted several times in the park, but one afternoon a disciple of Spencer's appeared, a seedy tramp with a dirty coat buttoned tightly at the throat to conceal the absence of a shirt. Battle royal was waged, amid the smoking of many cigarettes and the expectoration of much tobacco juice, wherein the tramp successfully held his own, even when a socialist workman sneered. There is no God but the unknowable, and Herbert Spencer is his prophet. Martin was puzzled as to what the discussion was about, but when he rode on to the library he carried with him a newborn interest in Herbert Spencer, and because of the frequency with which the tramp had mentioned first principles, Martin drew out that volume. So the great discovery began. Once before he had tried Spencer, and choosing the principles of psychology to begin with, he had failed as abjectly as he had failed with Madame Blavatsky. There had been no understanding the book, and he had returned it unread. But this night, after algebra and physics, and an attempt at a sonnet, he got into bed and opened first principles. Morning found him still reading. It was impossible for him to sleep. Nor did he write that day. He lay on the bed till his body grew tired when he tried the hard floor, reading on his back, the book held in the air above him, or changing from side to side. He slept that night, and did his writing next morning, and then the book tempted him. And he fell, reading all afternoon, oblivious to everything, and oblivious to the fact that that was the afternoon Ruth gave to him. His first consciousness of the immediate world about him was when Bernard Higginbotham jerked open the door and demanded to know if he thought they were running a restaurant. Martin Eden had been mastered by curiosity all his days. He wanted to know, and it was this desire that had sent him adventuring over the world. But he was now learning from Spencer that he never had known, and that he never could have known had he continued his sailing and wandering forever. He had merely skimmed over the surface of things, observing detached phenomena, accumulating fragments of facts making superficial little generalizations, and all and everything quite unrelated in a capricious and disorderly world of whim and chance. The mechanism of the flight of birds he had watched and reasoned about with understanding, but it had never entered his head to try to explain the process whereby birds, as organic flying mechanisms, had been developed. He had never dreamed there was such a process. That bird should have come to be was unguessed, they always had been, they just happened. And as it was with birds, so it had been with everything. His ignorant and unprepared attempts at philosophy had been fruitless. The medieval metaphysics of Kant had given him the key to nothing, and had served the sole purpose of making him doubt his own intellectual powers. In similar manner his attempt to study evolution had been confined to a hopelessly technical volume by Romanus. He had understood nothing, and the only idea he had gathered was that evolution was a dry-as-dust theory of a lot of little men possessed by huge and unintelligible vocabularies. And now he learned that evolution was no mere theory, but an accepted process of development, 
that scientists no longer disagreed about it, their only differences being over the method of evolution. And here was the man Spencer, organizing all knowledge for him, reducing everything to unity, elaborating ultimate realities, and presenting to his startled gaze a universe so concrete of realization that it was like the model of a ship such as sailors make and put into glass bottles. There was no caprice, no chance. All was law. It was in obedience to law that the bird flew, and it was in obedience to the same law that fermenting slime had writhed and squirmed, and put out legs and wings and become a bird. Martin had ascended from pitch to pitch of intellectual living, and here he was at a higher pitch than ever. All the hidden things were laying their secrets bare. He was drunken with comprehension. At night, asleep, he lived with the gods in colossal nightmare, and awake in the day, he went about like a somnambulist, with absent stare, gazing over the world he had just discovered. At table he failed to hear the conversation about petty and ignoble things, his eager mind seeking out and following cause and effect in everything before him. In the meat on the platter he saw the shining sun, and traced its energy through all its transformations, to its source a hundred million miles away, or traced its energy ahead to the moving muscles in his arms that enabled him to cut the meat, and to the brain wherewith he willed the muscles to move to cut the meat, until, with inward gaze, he saw the same sun shining in his brain. He was entranced by illumination, and did not hear the bug-house whispered by Jim, nor see the anxiety on his sister's face, nor notice the rotary motion of Bernard Higginbotham's finger, whereby he imparted the suggestion of wheels revolving in his brother-in-law's head. What, in a way, most profoundly impressed Martin, was the correlation of knowledge, of all knowledge. He had been curious to know things, and whatever he acquired he had filed away in separate memory compartments in his brain. Thus, on the subject of sailing he had an immense store. On the subject of woman he had a fairly large store. But these two subjects had been unrelated. Between the two memory compartments there had been no connection. That, in the fabric of knowledge, there should be any connection whatever between a woman with hysterics and a schooner carrying a weather helm or heaving to in a gale would have struck him as ridiculous and impossible. But Herbert Spencer had shown him not only that it was not ridiculous, but that it was impossible for there to be no connection. All things were related to all other things, from the farthermost star in the wastes of space to the myriads of atoms in the grain of sand under one's foot. This new concept was a perpetual amazement to Martin, and he found himself engaged continually in tracing the relationship between all things under the sun and on the other side of the sun. He drew up lists of the most incongruous things and was unhappy until he succeeded in establishing kinship between them all, kinship between love, poetry, earthquake, fire, rattlesnakes, rainbows, precious gems, monstrosities, sunsets, the roaring of lions, illuminating gas, cannibalism, beauty, murder, lovers, fulcrums, and tobacco. Thus he unified the universe, and held it up and looked at it, or wandered through its byways and alleys and jungles, not as a terrified traveler, in the thick of mysteries seeking an unknown goal, but observing and charting and becoming familiar with all there was to know. And the more he knew, the more passionately he admired the universe and life, and his own life in the midst of it all. You fool! he cried at his image in the looking-glass. You wanted to write, and you tried to write, and you had nothing in you to write about. What did you have in you? Some childish notions, a few half-baked sentiments, a lot of undigested beauty, a great black mass of ignorance, a heart filled to bursting with love, and an ambition as big as your love and as futile as your ignorance. And you wanted to write. Why, you're just on the edge of beginning to get something in you to write about. You wanted to create beauty, but how could you when you knew nothing about the nature of beauty? 
you wanted to write about life when you knew nothing of the essential characteristics of life you wanted to write about the world and the scheme of existence when the world was a chinese puzzle to you and all that you could have written would have been about what you did not know of the scheme of existence but cheer up martin my boy you'll write yet you know a little very little and you're on the right road now to know more some day if you're lucky you may come pretty close to knowing all that may be known then you will write he brought his great discovery to ruth sharing with her all his joy and wonder in it but she did not seem to be so enthusiastic over it she tacitly accepted it and in a way seemed aware of it from her own studies it did not stir her deeply as it did him and he would have been surprised had he not reasoned it out that it was not new and fresh to her as it was to him arthur and norman he found believed in evolution and had read spencer though it did not seem to have made any vital impression upon them while the young fellow with the glasses and the mop of hair will only sneered disagreeably at spencer and repeated the epigram there is no god but the unknowable and herbert spencer is his prophet but martin forgave him the sneer for he had begun to discover that Olney was not in love with Ruth. Later he was dumbfounded to learn from various little happenings not only that Olney did not care for Ruth, but that he had a positive dislike for her. Martin could not understand this. It was a bit of phenomena that he could not correlate with all the rest of the phenomena in the universe. But nevertheless he felt sorry for the young fellow, because of the great lack in his nature that prevented him from a proper appreciation of Ruth's fineness and beauty. They rode out into the hills several Sundays on their wheels, and Martin had ample opportunity to observe the armed truce that existed between Ruth and Olney. The latter chummed with Norman, throwing Arthur and Martin into company with Ruth, for which Martin was duly grateful. Those Sundays were great days for Martin, greatest because he was with Ruth, and great also because they were putting him more on a par with the young men of her class. In spite of their long years of disciplined education, he was finding himself their intellectual equal, and the hour spent with them in conversation was so much practice for him in the use of grammar he had studied so hard. He had abandoned the etiquette books, falling back upon observation, to show him the right things to do. Except when carried away by his enthusiasm, he was always on guard keenly watchful of their actions and learning their little courtesies and refinements of conduct the fact that spencer was very little read was for some time a source of surprise to martin herbert spencer said the man at the desk in the library oh yes a great mind but the man did not seem to know anything of the content of that great mind one evening at dinner when mr butler was there martin turned the conversation upon spencer Mr. Morse bitterly arraigned the English philosopher's agnosticism, but confessed that he had not read First Principles, while Mr. Butler stated that he had no patience with Spencer, had never read a line of him, and had managed to get along quite well without him. Doubts arose in Martin's mind, and had he been less strongly individual, he would have accepted the general opinion and given Herbert Spencer up. As it was, he found Spencer's explanation of things convincing, and, as he phrased it to himself, to give up Spencer would be equivalent to a navigator throwing the compass and chronometer overboard. So Martin went on into a thorough study of evolution, mastering more and more the subject himself, and being convinced by the corroborative testimony of a thousand independent writers. The more he studied, the more vistas he caught of fields of knowledge yet unexplored and the regret that days were only twenty-four hours long became a chronic complaint with him. One day, because the days were so short, he decided to give up algebra and geometry. Trigonometry he had not even attempted. Then he cut chemistry from his study list, retaining only physics. "'I am not a specialist,' he said in defense to Ruth, "'nor am I going to try to be a specialist.' There are too many special fields for any one man, in a whole lifetime, to master a tithe of them. I must pursue general knowledge. When I need the work of specialists, I shall refer to their books. But that is not like having the knowledge yourself, 
she protested. But it is unnecessary to have it. We profit from the work of specialists. That's what they are for. When I came in, I noticed the chimney sweeps at work. They're specialists, and when they get done, you will enjoy clean chimneys without knowing anything about the construction of chimneys. That's far-fetched, I am afraid. She looked at him curiously, and he felt a reproach in her gaze and manner. But he was convinced of the rightness of his position. All thinkers on general subjects, the greatest minds in the world, in fact, rely on specialists. Herbert Spencer did that. He generalized upon the findings of thousands of investigators. He would have had to live a thousand lives in order to do it all himself, and so with Darwin. He took advantage of all that had been learned by the florists and cattle breeders. "'You're right, Martin,' Olney said. "'You know what you're after, and Ruth doesn't. She doesn't know what she is after for herself, even.' "'Oh, yes,' Olney rushed on, heading off her objection. "'I know you call it general culture, but it doesn't matter what you study if you want general culture. You can study French, or you can study German, or cut them both out and study Esperanto. You'll get the culture tone just the same.' You can study Greek or Latin, too, for that same purpose. Though it will never be any use to you. It will be culture, though. Why, Ruth studied Saxon, became clever in it. That was two years ago, and all she remembers of it now is, on that sweet April with his showers sweet. Isn't that the way it goes? But it's given you the culture tone just the same, he laughed, again heading her off. I know, we were in the same classes. "'But you speak of culture as if it was a means to something,' Ruth cried out. Her eyes were flashing, and in her cheeks were two spots of color. Culture is an end in itself. "'But that is not what Martin wants. How do you know?' "'What do you want, Martin?' Olney demanded, turning squarely upon him. Martin felt very uncomfortable, and he looked entreaty at Ruth. "'Yes, what do you want?' Ruth asked. "'That will settle it.' Yes, of course I want culture, Martin faltered. I love beauty, and culture will give me finer and greater appreciation of beauty. She nodded her head and looked triumphant. Rot, and you know it, was Olney's comment. Martin's after career, not culture. It just happens that culture, in his case, is incidental to career. If he wanted to be a chemist, culture would be unnecessary. Martin wants to write, but he's afraid to say so because it will put you in the wrong. And why does Martin want to write, he went on, because he isn't rolling in wealth. Why do you fill your head with Saxon and general culture? Because you don't have to make your way in the world. Your father sees to that. He buys your clothes for you and all the rest. What rotten good is our education, yours and mine and Arthur's and Norman's? We're soaked in general culture, and if our daddies went broke today, we'd be falling down tomorrow on teachers' examinations. The best job you could get, Ruth, would be a country school or music teacher in a girls' boarding school. And pray, what would you do? she asked. Not a blessed thing. I could earn a dollar and a half a day common labor, and I might get in as an instructor at Hanley's cramming joint. I say I might, mind you, and I might be chucked out at the end of the week for sheer inability. Martin followed the discussion closely, and while he was convinced that only was right, he resented the rather cavalier treatment he accorded Ruth. A new conception of love formed in his mind as he listened. Reason had nothing to do with love. It mattered not whether the woman he loved reasoned correctly or incorrectly. Love was above reason. If it just happened that she did not fully appreciate his necessity for a career, that did not make her a bit less lovable. She was all lovable and what she thought had nothing to do with her lovableness. "'What's that?' he replied to a question from Olney that broke in upon his train of thought. "'I was saying that I hoped you wouldn't be a fool enough to tackle Latin.' "'But Latin is more than culture,' Ruth broke in. "'It is equipment.' "'Well, are you going to tackle it?' Olney persisted. Martin was sore beset. He could see that Ruth was hanging eagerly upon his answer. I am afraid I won't have time, he said finally. I'd like to, but I won't have time. You see, Martin's not seeking culture. Only exalted. He's trying to get somewhere, to do something. Oh, but it's mental training, it's mind discipline. 
It's what makes disciplined minds. Ruth looked expectantly at Martin, as if wanting for him to change his judgment. You know, the football players have to train before the big game, and that is what Latin does for the thinker. It trains. Rot and bosh! That's what they told us when we were kids. But there is one thing that they didn't tell us then. They let us find it out for ourselves afterwards. Only paused for effect, then added. And what they didn't tell us was that every gentleman should have studied Latin, but that no gentleman should know Latin. Now that's unfair, Ruth cried. I knew you were turning the conversation just in order to get off something. It's clever, all right, was the retort, but it's fair, too. The only men who know their Latin are the apothecaries, the lawyers, and the Latin professors. And if Martin wants to be one of them, I miss my guess. But what's all that got to do with Herbert Spencer, anyway? Martin's just discovered Spencer, and he's wild over him. Why? Because Spencer is taking him somewhere. Spencer couldn't take me anywhere, nor you. We haven't got anywhere to go. You'll get married some day, and I'll have nothing to do but keep track of the lawyers and business agents who will take care of the money my father's going to leave me." Only got up to go, but turned at the door and delivered a parting shot. You leave Martin alone, Ruth. He knows what's best for himself. Look at what he's done already. He makes me sick sometimes, sick and ashamed of myself. He knows more now about the world and life and man's place and all the rest than Arthur or Norman or I or you, too, for that matter, and in spite of all our Latin and French and Saxon and culture. But Ruth is my teacher, Martin answered chivalrously. She is responsible for what little I have learned. Rats! Only looked at Ruth, and his expression was malicious. I suppose you'll be telling me next that you read Spencer on her recommendation, only you didn't and she doesn't know anything more about Darwin and evolution than I do about King Solomon's mines. What's that jawbreaker definition about something or other, of Spencer's, that you sprang on us the other day, that indefinite, incoherent homogeneity thing? Spring it on her, and see if she understands a word of it. That isn't culture, you see. Well, tra-la, if you tackle Latin, Martin, I won't have any respect for you. And all the while, interested in the discussion, Martin had been aware of an irk in it as well. It was about studies and lessons, dealing with the rudiments of knowledge, and the schoolboyish tone of it conflicted with the big things that were stirring in him. With the grip upon life that was even then crooking his fingers like eagle's talons, with the cosmic thrills that made him ache, and with the inchoate consciousness of mastery of it all. He likened himself to a poet wrecked on the shores of a strange land, filled with power of beauty, stumbling and stammering and vainly trying to sing in the rough barbaric tongue of his brethren in the new land. And so with him. He was alive, painfully alive, to the great universal things, and yet he was compelled to potter and grope among schoolboy topics and debate whether or not he should study Latin. What in hell has Latin got to do with it? he demanded before his mirror that night. I wish dead people would stay dead. Why should I and the beauty in me be ruled by the dead? Beauty is alive and everlasting. Languages come and go. They are the dust of the dead. And his next thought was that he had been phrasing his ideas very well, and he went to bed wondering why he could not talk in similar fashion when he was with Ruth. He was only a schoolboy, with a schoolboy's tongue when he was in her presence. Give me time, he said aloud. Only give me time. Time, 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 was his unending plaint. End of chapter 13